first up, uh, Jeff, did you still want to talk about the database just a tiny bit? Um, we had a request from David to just talk about what that index.transit file is and like kind of use that as a seed to start like, can somebody hack at that right now? What would they need to learn to be able to do that? What are sort of like the enablers on that specific side? Right now our so, database is stored as like an index.transit file. And that's really just like another serialization to go from Eden, which is closures, data format, and data notation, which, and it just like compresses it that like keys or whatever are like compressed down to like one or two characters. Uh, but it's extremely simple to convert it to Eden the standard closure data format, and maybe arguably we should just make it an Eden file uh, by default. So it's just like index.eden instead of index.transit. We just haven't prioritized it yet. So nothing, nothing crazy. Just Eden um, could then serialize it back to Eden like a four line script. But David had a question about that. No, no, no questions about that. Thanks. Yeah, I think Paul Paul was wondering about like how we represent the yeah, basically how things are represented. And it's my understanding that pretty much every block gets its own little more or less JSON or Eden blob that says what are its parents and what information is there about it, um, and then you just serialize to and from transit because a lot of the tools that he's been working on just are working with Obsidian where it's just very easy to just feed in text. And so the question is, um, how do you have these tools work over the Athens? I think it's a pretty easily surmountable thing, but the representation does matter. It's worth thinking about. Sure. Uh, tractable problems for sure. Uh, so what would be the best way to uh, present, I guess, like, do you, do, uh, like what order are we going to do it in? Uh, should, yeah. So I guess, is there an order that you guys want to go in? Yeah, I think I'm going to go and then Paul's going to go. Um, yeah. I'm going to do awesome. sort of a quick tour through a modern NLP, but which basically means what the heck is GPT-3 and a few other, uh, a few applications of it and a few uh, simpler demos. Um, but I'm going to mostly leave it up to Paul to talk about specific applications. Um, and so, yeah, my, my talk's going to be, as like I said, a tour through modern NLP. And I'm sort of all thinking about this through the eyes of what does it look like to build a natural language ID for thought? Like, if we're going to uh, build analogs of the sort of things you have when you're writing code, you need a lot of sort of more intelligent systems that operate over language. And this is going to be pretty, I'm going to be going pretty quickly. Please feel free to interrupt me, um, ask questions. I appreciate making sure uh, I clarify anything. Um, and That's good. Uh, Everyone make sure you're, you're watching David's stream, by the way. All right. And can you all see my screen and hear me all right? Awesome. OK. So pretty much the story of NLP over the past decade or so has been just simplifying 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 like originally it'd be text comes in and you have a bunch of really bespoke parts like you have one part that will parse it into different into sort of a tree of how things relate you'll have one system the ner named entity recognition that says like oh like paul that's a name and this like paul brickman that's a full um that's actually one entity and like tagging things oh this is a noun this is a verb and essentially, the past five years, a lot of things have just been simplifying. Now it's like text comes in, you feed it into BERT, which I'll talk about a little bit, or GP3 or one of these models. And you just sort of use one model for every single task. And uh, I'm gonna, I have some links at the end. If you want to follow along the slides, I sent these in the meeting chat. Um, I sent the PDF that I'll be presenting from. Um, and later on, feel free to ask me questions. And I also have some links at the end if you're interested in learning more about NLP in general or some of these things. And essentially, what we've ended up with is, you know, each of these systems, the token, the tagger, the parser, the name any recognition, they're all just like you have this one model and you can specialize it for each of the specific tasks. So, you know, you want to do some question answering. Well, that's just a diff slightly different output for the model 
than if you want to do a uh, classifying spam or not. And so everything sort of converged on this one building block. Uh, and then a lot of the magic now is just in like how you specify the data that comes in and goes out. And so to make this a little bit more concrete, um, T5 was a model that came out a little bit before GPT-3, but it's essentially one big model that's just trying to do all these tasks in one. And you tell it what to do by literally saying in English or in text what the task is. So for example, you say translate English to German, colon, that is good, and it outputs, das ist gut. Or you have some task that is trying to judge whether a sentence um, is good or bad. And so in this case, the prompt is cola sentence, and then the text, and it says not acceptable or acceptable. And then, oh, so in all of these cases, um, you have some text and you have like a prompt that basically specializes the model, puts it into some mode where it's going to accomplish the task. So you want to summarize, well, there's a special summarize prompt that makes it summarize whatever text you feed in. And so you, you encounter the technology underlying these like pretty much every day. You probably use T9 or text completion in some form for a long time. So if you're texting on your phone, you'll see uh, it tries to complete the next word. If you're in Gmail and you're writing an email, often it'll try to complete one word or possibly a few words. But these are pretty constrained applications. Um, these models are pretty are much more general. So the the way that these are trained, like all of these, basically operate by trying to predict or word or phrase in context. So and usually it's like a lot of text. It's like basically take a copy of the internet, take one of these models, and you're going to take a sentence and have it predict. Okay, what's the next word? Or take a sentence, block out some things, and have it predict what goes in that spot. So if I say Adding extensions to Athens opens up a question mark, question mark, question mark. And Mal says, OK, the next, next word is world. And then you continue. Adding an extension to Athens opens up a world of possibilities. Or likewise, instead of just completing left to right, like generating one word at a time, you can have the sentence and you can block things out. If you've ever done closed deletion and flashcards, it's a similar idea. Or like a fill in the blank test, it's exactly the same. And so you have adding blank to Athens opens up a world of blank. And each of these has some word that fills it in. And it is sort of a crazy property of language that just doing this task, you get a lot of emergent properties. Just learning to predict the next word, you have to understand a lot about what's going on. And it seems that the models are able to generalize to tasks they haven't seen or to pretty novel things. And so I'm going to go through some example use cases for a language model. Um, I think pretty much everyone has heard of GPT-3 at this point, but it is one of these like left to right ones um, where you're trying to fill in the next word. And so for all of these, if you go to their example, their page, they have like, you know, oh, here are 100 applications. And what's interesting is all these applications, it's using the same underlying tech, right? It's just complete the next word. But the magic is in how you prompt it and what you tell it to do. So you give it some context and you're trying to make it so that the, the most likely completion is something you want to do. So, you know, they have here like, oh, you can make a chat bot or you can have a translation system or you can make something that classifies like is a tweet uh, offensive or not offensive. Um, so to make these a little bit more concrete, so you want to get them all to do a task. You need to prompt it. The language models are trained to complete text, so you want to make it so that the natural completion of your text is the task you want. So, an example, I want to come up with a bunch of ideas for ways we could use this stuff with Athens. So I say, Gail's a brilliant AI researcher and HCI researcher. Here are 10 of her ideas for enabling creativity by integrating natural language tools into writing tools. One, I, I list two ideas, and then I say three, and there's the blank. And I, I tried this out in the GPT-3 um, playground. You can sort of see what it looks like. So the bold part at the top is the prompt that I gave it. So I, list, I gave it a few ideas like, oh, we can provide feedback on writing. You can visualize semantically related notes. And then it generated all of these other 20 and you know, it could, it could keep going, but there's only so much space. They could summarize documents. They could categorize documents. They could help us outline. They could suggest titles. Um, they could correct spelling and grammar. And a lot of, you know, some of the ideas are hit or miss, but I think that the one of the really powerful things here is using these as generative capabilities. Like, I generally believe that we as humans are pretty good at judging. Like, if I presented you with a list of these hundred ideas, 
you could probably pick out five of them that you're like, oh, you know, that's actually a pretty decent idea. And so it's this possibility of um, getting around writer's block and letting you come up with new ideas. So as a further example of this caveat, I don't actually know what the most requested features in Athens are. But I say, the Athens team is a brilliant team of designers creating a powerful application for et cetera, et cetera. Here's a list of their most requested features. Collaboration, comments, implementing extensions, allowing exports, integrating AI, and then, you know, it comes up with a whole list of other things. And some of these are more applicable than others, and you can, there is an art to making the prompt. Like, maybe if I said a team of designers and engineers, it would say something different. Um, it's, it's more art than science at this point. But I think you get a little... Was, was this actually generated from GPT-3? Yeah, everything after six. So in this, in this previous one, five onward is generated, and in this one, six onward. So searching documents, semantic highlighting, customized layouts, tutorials, ease of use, um, allowing customized interface. Like, you know, all these are pretty reasonable features that someone may want in one of these things, right? Um, and I can... I'll, after the presentations, I have the playground up if folks want to try things in it. Cool. I, I want to export Athens to, to Word. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great feature. <laughs> um, and, you know, in this case, I've been showing you, like, okay, let's, let's generate lists of ideas. But here's, here's an example from the paper. Um, like, generally, it's, it's often, there's this idea of uh, the model can either have seen examples of exactly the task you want, or in the prompt, you can provide examples. So here, we're trying to teach it to correct our English. And so we have a bunch of examples. Again, all of the sort of gray things. It's like, poor, poor English. I eated the purple berries. Good English. I ate the purple berries. Poor English, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end, we provide the poor, like, you know, I write a sentence, and I want to have it corrected. Well, I say poor English input, and then my sentence, and then good English output, and then whatever it generates there would be its correction. And so by, you can kind of think of this like you have language model, you do, you partially apply, like you're, you're currying, partially applying the prompt to it. And now you have a grammar corrector where you give it an English sentence that maybe has bad grammar and it gives you hopefully a better English sentence. Um, and you can do that for all sorts of things, right? Um, there are, people have come up with all sorts of really cool demos for these. So there's this tool, PseudoWrite, which you search around, is essentially GPT-3 for writers. So this is a UI for collaborative writing with a language model. And so here I, I copied a, uh, some of an article about the As You May Think essay and then wrote, wrote a paragraph. Now in the year 2030, these ideas have evolved significantly. We speak to our computers on a daily basis. Creative, creative work is done in partnership. Uh, and then it basically, on this right column, it suggests here are 10 possible completions. And so this, this gets into the like ways of getting around writer's block or just sort of breaking out of whatever your narrow view is. Like you have, you know, um, you have a particular perspective and it can be really helpful to have this model just generate. Sometimes the ideas are really stupid, but sometimes the stupid ideas are the most generative in a way. And they're the most that you see and you're like, okay, that's silly, but actually, you know, maybe there's something here. And so I think this is a really powerful way to work um, and something we'll be seeing more and more of as we go forward. And people have also done all sorts of kind of crazy things around um, generating programs with it. Uh, if you search around like GPT-3 demos on Twitter, like you can find a whole host. Um, this is one I think is pretty cute, especially because it doesn't have a vision system, so it can't actually see things. Um, but this is a, the guy basically architected the prompt so that it is now like, you know, you are a JavaScript programmer making websites. Um, your job is to make a website that has a button that looks like a watermelon. And then it completes it and it, you know, it generates a button that is pink and has the word watermelon on it, which is, you know, it's simple, but also kind of crazy. And I think a hint of things to come. Uh, I do believe that we're going to be programming by natural language within five years. Um, and it's, it's coming faster than people think. Um, 
and just expect to see more and more results of this sort over the coming years. And as a little bit more out there, this one's a, a little bit trickier to understand, but this is, uh, and if you want to like also check out these links again, uh, check out the meeting note. I think I put it in meeting chat or meeting notes. Um, I have all of these URLs there and you can, you can check them out. And so in this case, for example, um, Andreas from this company called Elicit, he's building all these tools, oh, these tools that try to uh, let you build complex pipelines of language models. So in this case, he's trying to, first he gets a list, this first column is AI professors. And then he has a bunch, he wants to add a bunch of columns and his spec, his spec for each column is actually a natural language sentence of like, what institution is Stuart Russell affiliated with? What institution is Peter Norvig affiliated with? Um, so that's the second column. Then the third one is what field of AI does Peter Norvig work on? What field of AI does Jan LeCun work in? Um, who does Andrew Ng work with? Who, you know, and so these are, um, and I think this is a like, I think the pattern to see here is these are all things you can express in code. Maybe some of them would actually be pretty hard to parse out, right? Like you actually have to like do a lot of natural language parsing. Um, but you can express these ideas in natural language and get a program out. Um, it's a little bit of a fuzzy program because it's implemented inside this big neural network block. Um, but it comes out and it actually can sort of execute uh, your natural language question, and get you back an answer. The tricky bit is sometimes it will be wrong. So I think that's a, like, people are still working on this. Who knows if we'll ever really solve it. But it's right a surprising amount of the time. And I think that's only going to get better. Um, any questions so far about these demos I've talked about? All right, cool. And so to reiterate this point about prompting, I kind of think of prompting a language model as you're, when you prompt it, you're adding, you're giving a particular lens or view. Like you could create a, um, you could prompt the model in such a way where it gives you very critical feedback or very positive feedback or where it's trying to find grammar errors or where it's trying to come up with a weaknesses in your argument. There's this idea, um, yeah, so when you're, you're prompting it, you are instantiating some particular language program. So you wanna generate ideas. As I showed you, you specify maybe some background on who's coming up with the ideas. Maybe if you specify a few examples and then it continues the bulleted list. Want feedback on idea? Say, oh, like, um, Jeff is a very thoughtful critic who is giving me feedback on the idea, blah, blah, blah. Complete it, perhaps with, even with some examples. Or you want to improve your writing style. You give examples of before and after, like here is an example of text in the passive voice, convert to the active voice, things of that sort. Related to the lens view, I, I've come across this idea of, this, this site's a little bit of a, a little bit crazy, this idiotomy one. Um, so this is a, a chart from this guy where he's trying to chart out like all these different strategies for coming up with ideas. And each of these strategies, you can instantiate as a little agent that's helping you. Like you can have an agent who's really good at coming up with stories or really an agent that's really good with sort of uh, coming up with implications of a concept or recognizing or tr proposing opposites. And so there are all of these different lenses or views, like you take your idea and you refract it through the come up with opposites view or the come up with contradictory ideas or come up with questions related to it. And each of these will have its own generative possibilities. Um, and so perhaps you can think of them as like cards you apply. It's like you have a playing deck of cards and you know you have your writing and you draw a card and it you know specify it um, gives you a bunch of ideas that are through that particular lens um, so so far i've talked about i've pretty much just been talking about gp3 these huge models um, that right now are pretty expensive to do inference on so they're really not that practical to use like literally every second they can be very helpful but I think a really important thing to point out is that simpler methods can feel really, really magical. Uh, I think Paul's done a really nice job of coming up with some applications that are like this that use really much more practical methods. Um, a simple one I quite like is uh, what's known 
well, it's pretty much just like randomness goes really far. You, if if I present you with twenty random blocks from your Athens database, you're going to see the, pa- the patterns and the ways that it makes sense. You're not going to be like, oh, these suck. You're going to be like, oh, like you know, actually, maybe maybe this way of doing design does actually match up with randomness or something. Um, and so one of the more powerful interfaces I've seen before was someone who just like, he had a little, alongside his notes, he had a shuffler that when he, whenever he was searching, it would have show both the like actual matches and it would also just be shuffling among randomly basically everything else. And occasionally you'd be like, oh, wait, that didn't come up via search, but like that was a really good idea. And this is something that I think Paul might talk about, but he has this idea of, um, in his Ionica project, the K-probes, which is you're not doing anything fancy. You're not using GPT-3 to look at your writing and come up with questions specific to it. You just have a list of questions and you present them to the user. Say, okay, how could we simplify this? What's the opposite of this idea? How can you just split it into parts? What do we need to know to actually know if this is true? And there are all of these really um, simple prompts you can use where people will just take them and use and be inspired to take a particular view on something. Um, somewhere between this very simple, like literally random and the cutting edge of modern NLP where you're using these big language models, A, there are smaller language models, which um, there are people who are trying to reduce GP3 type things in the open. And so that's a pretty cool project. But there's also um, word vectors, which some people may have come across. This sort of classic example is essentially being able to do analogies. So in word vectors, essentially you have a word and you have mapped it to some a series of numbers, so a vector in space. And these have some sort of geometrical properties where the classic example is if you take the vector for king and you subtract the vector for man and you add the vector for woman, the nearest uh, word vector is queen. And so it, down at the bottom here, I have an example from, um, from some of these papers where you can take, for example, a nationality and add a concept and then look up what are the concepts that are mapped near it. So if you take Russian and add river, you get the Mo- Moscow River, Volga River. Um, if you add Viet- no, take Vietnam at capital, you get a bunch of cities there, and I guess some Vietnamese and some other things. Um, and so there's this is a potentially a way to like do a little bit smarter um, for like you're not fully random, and you don't have to use like the super heavy duty stuff, but you actually do a pretty good job of representing text if you just map each of the words to a vector and average them together. And roughly you end up with a vector that represents that whole whole passage. Um, and there's there are things that are, are useful that are just going to be, let's pr- do traditional search. Just like you searched a word, I'm going to find exact matches to that, maybe it's synonyms. There's also, you searched a word, I'm going to find matches in this vector space. And those won't be like, oh, it's spelled the same. Those will be, oh, this actually has a similar feeling or sim- like sort of similar meaning. Um, and uh, also these analogy ideas are pretty powerful. Like, okay, you're, you're thinking about robots. Um, well, maybe we can add different concepts to that and see what, see what words or what ideas are adjacent to that. And so this is, again, just a, somewhere between the random and the full-on use all of the machinery. So last, I wanted to just get you thinking a little bit about, like, what would it look like to have sort of an NLP and AI-enabled um, IDE for thought? Like, if Athens or one of these tools really took this seriously and, like, took it as a first-class primitive, not something that is just happens to be added on later. Um, I don't really have answers here, but it's, it's worth thinking through, like, what do we have in a code IED? Like, you have auto-completion. Okay, well, you know, we are talking about the um, generating ideas and such. You have refactoring, like, what does it look like to refactor an argument or refactor text? You have highlighting errors and, and um, linting errors. 
searching and traversing code bases. Like this is something which I think Rome and, and all of this um, linking really has an, has enabled people to see where an idea is used, see where it's um, and see what other ones it references. You know, there are many other possibilities and things that people use in code IDEs. But it's worth asking, like, what are the analogs for natural language, and how do we instantiate them into an assistive agent? You know, I, we've covered a lot of these, like, at a high level, you have brainstorming and helping people get past writer's block. Like, oh, complete this list. Suggest you're writing on a block, like, suggest other blocks that are maybe very distant and not directly linked, but are semantically relevant and could help you generate new things. There's just question answering. Like when you search on Google and you you ask it a plain text question, sometimes it just tells you the answer. It's not like oh, you need web pages. It says like no, the answer is this. Um, Paul has some cool demos where he does exactly this and applies some of these question answering techniques uh, to a knowledge base. And then there's as I was describing earlier, semantic search of you're searching for something, and we're not just going to find you the verbatim overlap. Like okay, let's find nearby strings. It's Let's find something that means the same thing or has a similar sense, but maybe doesn't literally look exactly the same. Um, one that I think is really cool, but is going to take a little bit longer to get to. Um, when you search, often when you search on Google, and then you search something like, how old is Alan Kay? Like, it actually can translate that to a symbolic graph, um, query, sort of like these data log queries, and then execute it against um, the Google Knowledge Graph. And so it gets the actual, like there's, there's some structured representation of knowledge. It takes your natural language query, it converts it into a structured query, and then runs that against the graph. It will be possible, um, and it probably is already possible with a good amount of work. Like some, I'd be curious to actually try this GP, I have not. Um, to, for example, given a query, generate a data log query against your database. So find me pages which are modified today, and it can generate you a, in this case, this is a Rome, Rome data log query um, for that. And I think that's a, a pretty neat, like the, the interface of going from natural language query, natural language um, input to something more structured that basically you just execute with the rest of the traditional programming tools is a really powerful concept. Um, and I think a question to for everyone to ponder is like, what do we actually need to do at each time scale? I don't know. I think it's mostly about empowering community to explore the space of possibilities. So first, like really getting it such that someone could come along and implement some of these ideas in Athens, probably using plugins. Um, well, like what's actually required for someone to implement, for example, a sidebar that shows semantically relevant ideas across the code base. And then once you have something like this, like you can start to integrate the existing assistive tools. Um, Paul is going to talk about some of the ones he has already, which I think are pretty powerful. And then someday, well, the sky's the limit. Like, what vision do you find inspiring? Uh, what workflows can you imagine in five or ten years? Like, what what is using Athens going to look like in 2030? Uh, I think it's really exciting, and I, I look forward to talking about it with all of you. Thank you for listening. Um, have any questions now is a good time and if you are curious for resources i have a few more slides here at the end which talk about like sort of software infrastructure and like if specifically you want to learn about some of these things some good blogs and and um, there are these communities ml collective and Eleuther, which are sort of uh distributed organizations that think about doing open source ai research and such and various blog posts talking talking through this stuff all right thank you everyone I I have a question if possible. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I, so I I just because it's a bit technical. Just be, when you mention a word to Victor, uh, at some point, and before that you were talking about GPT, which I don't really understand technically. But I just my question is, does GPT or like transformer like model rely on word to Victor? To Victor? Or are those are like separate implementation and they are not related to each other? Yeah, so they're, um, they are separate implementations. Uh, essentially, the very first step of uh, GPT-3 is Vec. The very first step is you take in your, your words and you map them to vectors 
And then there's like a bunch of stuff on top of it too. Um, but they are the the key idea here is mapping text to a vector space, which then has some properties. Um, I didn't go into the details of how GPT works because that's a, that's a whole thing. Um, but I think the the main takeaway I want there is the possibility of that you just have this generic language machine that you can f specialize to doing particular goals, or that you can like really specialize to like implementing different languages. Mm -hmm. oh, makes sense. And just another uh, quick question for the example you mentioned on the slide. You mentioned that, uh, for example, you brought up the example for about the grammar. So I wonder, mm -hmm. like the example of the grammar, well, is it like similar to when you you are like loading already learned system and then you will you for example make it learn a specific thing but it already have like uh, a specific weights but you like keep optimizing for a specific test is it similar to that or it is like uh take like is it, yeah i just wanted to know like the task of teaching it should it be like mm -hmm. you have a huge like uh, labeled set and you feed it or is it like need like few sample? Yeah, so there's this idea of zero shot, which is just like you, the model has been trained and now you just present it the task and it does it immediately. And then there's few shot, which is maybe you, in the prefix, you say, give a few examples of good and bad, good and bad, and then give it a, a new one to solve. Um, I think essentially there's learning during training and the, the, basically the thing that's happening in these prompt ones are it's learning, but it's learning when it reads the prefix. It, it's not like actually incorporating the changes in static widgets that are shipped around, et cetera. It's like it reads your 100 words, and it is sort of conditioning itself to, to get into a mode where it, would output, where it would output the correct answer there. And so it's doing some learning as it decodes. Yeah, I think the concept of perfect in that was it new to me. So, yeah, it is not like exactly related to when you feed, like, for example, image, image net or ready learn system and you want to use it for specific images. Yeah. Uh, yes. So it is like true. there is a, a, a new Excuse layer me, on, on top of on, it. So, on top of uh, it. Yeah. I wanted to continue with because it's already been 35 minutes yeah. and yeah, usually we try to keep this to an hour so if we have more questions let's ask them in the chat or after at the end that's okay good. thanks everyone thank you so much right, uh, Paul do you want to start sharing your screen and then yep sure <clears throat> Right, so thanks, David, for the excellent overview. I'll try to go a bit more specific with with some concrete instances, basically, of the sort of technologies David talked about. So it might um, feel a bit closer to a bit more short term, maybe, and a bit more towards engineering than a broad overview. But uh, this is also helpful in the sense that you can get a sense of what can be done today uh, with some limited resources in a similar um, ecosystem, let's say, because this uh, main project I'll be talking about is a plugin for Obsidian, which I'm sure has a large overlap with the user base of Athens, but uh, either now or in the past. So basically, if I, if I do work in, so Duo is a virtual assistant for knowledge work. And what that means is that you, you have your average Obsidian setup. So this is Obsidian for those of you who aren't familiar with it. It's just more or less a, a text editor for short notes, which you can interconnect. You can connect with each other via links. I'm sure this is pretty familiar to, to many here. But besides this, the, the main thing I'm gonna talk about in this presentation is this part on the right, which is sort of like a chat. So this is the, um, the interface you're interacting with this uh, virtual assistant I'm talking about. And 
it has all the all the mechanics all the chat mechanics you'd expect from like a normal messaging app like the contact name and the status and a text box at the bottom and in the middle uh, we'll see the chat in a second and you just use it to interact with the system which is mostly based on technologies david talked about but um, there there are some twists so uh, right, you can you can interact with it in your normal app, which is similar to patterns, but what can it actually do? So those specific terms, uh, few shot and zero shot, were also brought up by by David. But in this um, like with dual, you actually describe similarly in natural language what uh, you sort of teach it to perform specific skills. You sort of help it acquire specific skills, which are simply specified in markdown files. So I'll go over that uh, in a second, but for now, just go, I'll give you half a minute to go through the chat on the right. So like stuff here. Right, so what's basically doing is I'm asking you to formulate a research question about the subject and it's answering in the chat with an actual research question about that subject. And the way this is happening is using this node on the left. Now, this is not uh, a normal node, which was the case on a previous slide, which was just to show you how the interface looks. This special node, in a sense, completely specifies this this behavior of of formulating a research question. As in, if you have a look, this is a pattern similar to what uh, David went through. Each uh, like you have a few examples of the sort of uh, task you want to specify. So on the first line, you have social media followed by a research question about social media. In this case, what effect does the use of Twitter have on the attention span of teenagers? And this pattern gets repeated over and over again for like five lines. That's that's enough. And then on this uh, almost almost the last uh, line, you have this placeholder, in which reads subject, which is just uh, italicized. So this is just markdown, and this is just a placeholder in italic. And this subject placeholder gets filled in with the actual subject of my queries of my messages sent in the chat. So if I send formulate a research question about virtual assistants, this subject here will get filled in with virtual assistants. Right, and that in itself is interesting, but not particularly useful. The main thing that happens um, that sort of implements this, this behavior is the fact that uh, there's also a command here asking, uh, asking this jewel to complete the pattern. And in completing the pattern, it essentially formulates another research question this time about this subject. So it's it's just um, a specific uh, way of phrasing this this prompt, this text in a way, which goes into this model, which only knows how to generate text further. But this, uh, it's, so if David brought up this angle of viewing, viewing prompts as programs, it would sort of consider this subject placeholder uh, sort of variable, which gets filled in at, uh, when it's used as a steel. That, um, I'm sure that was a bit confusing, but I'll, I have more examples, uh, which hopefully will make it clear how this thing works. So again, I'll give you a bit to go through the chat on the right. Right, so in this one, I'm sort of teaching it to give me concepts which are related to a certain concept. And this happens with a very similar pattern to the, to the skill in the previous slide. Namely, on each line, I basically have an example of how to do this task. I have atom is related to this and this and this and this. And this repeats itself for like only six lines. And then at the end, again, I have this sort of placeholder which reads topic is related to blah, blah, blah. And this uh, should get completed. Now, 
this right here, again, I, I mentioned that this file is just Markdown. This is a code block in Markdown, like with native uh, formatting, let's say. Just uh, three backticks followed by that. And this is just another command which I can send in in this chat here. So if I, if I send it as a message, write the paragraph based on a specific text, it will actually answer me with the completion. And this right here on the left is sort of a skill which builds on other skills <laughs> by simply issuing those commands, which I can issue myself. So sort of like a, if you put your programmer hat on, it's sort of like a, a function call specified in natural language as just a command in a similar way you'd ask someone to write a paragraph based on something or we'll see some other examples in a bit. Right, so same same thing as before, just go through the chat on the right and I'll make sure. Um, all right, so this one seems a bit more involved, but the underlying pattern is the same. So basically, I have many, many, I mean, not that many in the large scheme of things, but I have a handful of examples of what I want uh, this assistant to do. And basically, I want it, in this case, to teach it how to find the connection between two concepts and explicitly articulate that and respond with that. So I just have, as an example, how are jeans and cooking recipes related? Both specify steps to obtain an end product. Right. And I have a similar pattern over and over again. And at the end, I have Q, as in sort of for a question, but this is just text. So this is not um, a clunky specific syntax which has to be used. This is just text and is intuitive to when you read it. So it must be intuitive to the model in some sense as well. So here, Q stands maybe for a question, then, then the actual placeholder for a command, which gets filled in with my command which is, let's see, the first question here. And then there's this A, which maybe stands for an answer. And then it has to complete the pattern, similarly as before. And in completing this pattern, it sort of highlights the connections between the concepts I've specified. By simply providing those examples, I can get this behavior in return from a virtual assistant. Now, I'll also take this opportunity to mention a few other things. So. If you read the first two messages, what's the connection between Obsidian and note-taking? Obsidian is a cognitive ergonomic alternative to traditional note-taking. Um, this might not be the most popular way of putting this on, like, online in the text the initial model has been trained on, but the catch is that this GPT model, which in this case it's uh, GPT-2, not GPT-3, and it runs on your machine. It's small enough to run on your machine at a decent speed. It has been fine-tuned on my on my notes, on my knowledge base, in a sense. And this is a this is an important point because this is yet another dimension, let's say, another way in which you can influence the behaviors of those models. So on one hand, you can just specify this prompt, this text, which they have to complete in a like specific uh, engineer it in a clever way. That's one way of sort of describing a behavior, but you can also fine tune it on a certain knowledge base. And what that means is that it more or less learns your style, your way of speaking or uh, your uh, cliches and so on. And this is a result of it being fine tuned on my own notes. And if you, if you would work with me, you'd definitely think this is something I would say. So in a way, it's um, it's closer to how I how I would speak myself, and this um, this makes it useful in some surprising ways in in those chats. Yeah. It, it oh, a familiar face though. <laughs> Uh, right, so, um, yeah, so on one hand, fine-tuning it on my knowledge base as an extra initial step, which you only have to do once, more or less, gives it my style, my self-writing, more or less. But it also teaches it about various entities, which it would have no way of knowing about otherwise. So 
In the second exchange, there's what's that matchup between Duo and Rust? They're both based on Rust. And there is no, like when GPT-2 has been trained, Duo hasn't been around, <laughs> and definitely not in this sense as a virtual assistant, it's probably a bunch of things with using the same name. But also in the second one, so those are two organizations, and somehow it knows that, uh, yeah, they're both working with AI. And this is also an organization, I think, which was mentioned in David's slide. So yeah, both of them are have been created after this model have been, uh, has been initially trained. So all those, all this knowledge, both the way I'm generally writing and specific knowledge more or less about, uh, about entities gets simply extracted by being trained for a bit on my own notes. So this is what fine tuning is, is we're doing the, the process of training again, but just for a short amount of time and on a limited data set to sort of just inherit this new style. Uh, but yeah, as David mentioned, they're not really making them factually correct is still ongoing research. So if you look in the, in the last exchange here, how are Obsidian and Rome research related? They're both, uh, they're open source tools for cognitive augmentation. So they're not uh, open source tools and that I think is uh, something Jeff knows very well. <laughs> um, but yeah, even if it's not uh, factually correct, um, it's doing its best to sort of confabulate something which sort of goes in there. And it's also biased with my own terms and I speak about open source tools uh, a lot in my notes and so on. So there's this bias nudging it away from, from facts, more or less. Um, right. Why do you think it says, so why do you think it said they were open source if they're not? So I, so again, I sort of talk about open source, uh, a lot in my, in my working notes and open source tools and so on. So we got, uh, maybe, yeah, I, when confabulating this completion, when being tasked with coming up with this, with this completion, it was basically biased as a product of this fine tuning process on my notes. So if I'm talking about this stuff on a, on an ongoing basis, it learned to also do that more or less, you know, and it leads to some weird results in this case, but it's not that far off. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, before I showed you some examples of specifying the behavior of teaching it a specific skill using a few examples, that's why it's called FewShot. It's basically, it has to learn this task after a few examples. So you can also not specify any examples at all and just try to prescribe the, the, the task, you know, in a clever way with, with prompt engineering. So like put together a clever prompt without, which doesn't really contain examples of, of what it's supposed to do. And it can still work in many situations, uh, as in this one. So this time first have a look on the, on the left. So this is a task of answering open questions. So how this skill file, let's say, is structured, it has just several lines. And the first one reads, list notes about, list notes about, uh, about the topic. Again, this topic placeholder gets filled in when I ask it something, as in, how can we develop transformative tools for thought? This probably gets filled in with tools for thought. Now this, this command as a whole, is something again, which I could just send in the chat myself. So list notes about something. Um, and it would know because there is a skill for that, because this is just a command, which I can also similar to something that I can send in the chat. And I would get in return. If I, if I were to send it in the chat, I would get in return messages containing my notes, basically my notes about the specific topic. Right. Um, so here the code block would expand into my notes, sort of like a function call, if you again put your programmer hat on. Um, so instead of when this file is being used, in a sense, as part of the conversation, those, uh, this block would be expanded in several related notes. Now, uh, this part would be appended, as in just Q for maybe question, and then uh, the placeholder for my actual question, which would get filled in, then A for the answer, and then 
it's being asked to complete the pattern. And in this case, the pattern is answering the question. And there's no example of doing that so far. So um, if you look at this one, maybe, what does it feel like to build a virtual assistant? It feels like you. Virtual assistants are blah, 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 blah. Uh, conversational interfaces. Uh, the task of conversational interfaces is to abstract away the details of the hardware, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it confabulates its way forward in an attempt to basically answer you to a question. But my point is that simply specifying this structure here uh, is enough to sort of teach it how to answer questions based on your notes, more or less, so, because you also provide a context through your notes here. Right. Again, very similar example here. Again, look, look on the left first. So this, uh, this is a skill of coming up with questions about the topic. And again, uh, it's tasked with finding notes about the topic, then just adding, like simply appending to that text. Here's a list of questions related to that topic. And then coming up with a completion. And the, this completion, the output of the final block, which in this case is, the, is this completion, gets piped back into the chat. So my, the messages I'm sending in are sort of like an input, and the, the output of the final block send, uh, are being piped back in the chat as an output, as a response, more or less. So there's this um, conversational interface above, like over on top of the, the language model. Um, which is made possible with those skills, basically. Um, right, yeah, so you can have a look at the chat now, maybe. Yeah, I also have the, the slide deck. I just sent it before as a PDF in the chat, so if you wanna look more at the examples, you can just have a look through that file. Right, uh, final example with this structure. Again, find notes about this topic, then add, here are the key takeaways from this line of reasoning, and then uh, ask it to complete stuff. And then if you just ask it, please the main points from my notes about the second brain. It starts first, blah, blah, blah. Second, blah, blah, blah. Third, blah, blah, blah. So it sort of gives you a laundry list of first, second, third, blah, blah, blah uh, takeaways. Uh, more more or less like a like highlights uh, sort of summary by simply only like by mean, merely having three lines here we can specify this behavior um uh, right and this was all using language models but i think uh david also hinted at the fact of sort of interfacing those fuzzy flexible models which really know know how to adapt to to text to things specified in text with more symbolic, let's say, hardcore programmatic environments like a database or a, a graph, a knowledge graph or queries, um, which work with a specific, uh, specifically de uh, defined syntax and only know how to work with that. So this final example um, is about, like, yeah, just uh, have a look on the, on the right in the chat. Right, so this is this skill. This is a skill of uh, getting stuff from Wikipedia, more or less, based on uh, based on a, a property, for instance, director and entity. Uh, let's say the Godfather. So this is good old uh, JavaScript putting together an HTTP request with a certain structure, but it's using the same placeholders as the previous uh, things. So entity here, property. And those are still being extracted from my request in a sort of fuzzy way. And the result of this skill, similar to the ones before, gets routed back in the chat as a response by actually making that request to, to Wikidata, which is a, a machine-friendly version of Wikipedia, more or less. Um, right, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm really over time. OK, I can just rush through a couple more slides. So. Um, the reason I mostly talked about this project is that it's really general and you can easily adapt it to new tasks. So you can teach it new skills by just describing it in some in one way or another. 
And it's very like this advantage of only having to specify a few examples to to define a behavior is really valuable and makes it really easy to adapt in contrast with uh, maybe also what have, has been asked before about training those models. So this is not really training at all. This is just coming up with a clever clever prompt which has to be completed in, in most situations. Right, but just uh, spending a couple of slides on more specific um, uh, narrow Neural applications of such models, which are, aren't GPT stuff, but like specialized models trained on other specific things from this uh, Psionica group. There's this AutoCards, which is basically a tool which takes in a piece of arbitrary text, so this is just a quote, and spits out flashcards, more or less. Questions, which are formulated from scratch, whose answer is directly extracted from the text. So if you just read the first sentence, King Philip's ultimate goal was to conquer Persia and blah, blah, blah. So then from this initial sentence, you get the flashcard, what was King Philip's ultimate goal? Answer, conquer Persia, Persia. And using this, uh, it, this, this is trivial to, to then input into, import into Enki or Supermem or whatever you're using. So the purpose of this, specific tool was to just take in text and spit out flashcards more or less and it uses the the t5 uh, model david mentioned in his presentation um right but again i had a couple slides where this sort of behavior more or less could be specified as a skill for dual so that's why i'm saying that dual is more general and can sort of house many specific niche applications like this one, which was a previous project. So it can really expand into a bunch of niches. And the other specific project I wanted to bring up is directly an instance of the, of the work, uh, a direct application, let's say, experimentation of, uh, of the word vectors, which uh, David brought up. So this semantica consists of several of five smaller tools, which are like, imagine using Photoshop and having that specific tools on the, on the left, like crop, um, fill. <laughs> I'm not even using Photoshop, so I hope that's a fairly good metaphor though. Um, so for instance, one such tool is mix. You can think of it as mixing colors maybe, but here you're mixing meanings, you're mixing concepts, which is similar to David's screenshot of a table where you'd add sort of concepts together. Like there was the example of Vietnam and capital. This mix operator more or less does exactly that. So if you mix people with chaos, you get as a result, anarchy, civil strife, uh, bloodshed, upheaval, stuff like that. If you mix computer with virus, you, you don't get um, COVID and pandemic and stuff like that. You get antivirus software, malware, spyware, specific um, like things in common with computer. And here is the same. Uh, and here there's another operator involved. There's this shift, which is sort of helping you create an analogy. So this one is easier to understand. So you're mixing saxophone, but you're not mixing it with another concept. You're mixing it with a shift from jazz to rock, if that makes sense. And you obtain guitar, bass guitar, guitars, electric guitar, blah, blah, blah. So you can sort of think of saxophone being to jazz as guitars are to rock, more or less, or something in that direction. And those are just two of those primitives. And there are like three more on, like on, the, website, on the website as part of uh, this project, which, is, which was mostly an exploration of putting together like a sort of library you could use in the command line for now, which is less practical than dual, which is a plugin for Obsidian, but it was still an interesting exploration. Right, so those projects were, um, were part of this group, which is uh, just an open collective, mostly on Discord. So this is just a, a short plug. And another really quick plug, we're uh, organizing this unconference in like a month, which is basically, uh, if you participate, you can basically host your own sessions about tools for thought in general. So uh, again, I have 
you can look through this slide afterwards. But that was mostly my deck, and I hope that made sense. And if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to ask. I'm not sure if you're over time. <laughs> Sorry for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. That was awesome. Thank you, David.